All right. So. All right. So did you record yet? Yes. All right. Perfect. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. I know that, uh, well, I'm going to get started on time, but I know that people are going to be coming in a little late. You know, this traffic today was pretty bad. So uh, so I know that people are going to be slowly coming in. Uh, today, we're going to go over uh, something of a compliance class. Today, we're going to go over the 2000, uh, the December 2000 modification of our, of our, of our purchase agreements. Okay, every couple of years or so, I've seen they've always, you know, tweaked the, the purchase agreements. Things come up, they tweak it, and um, and they send it to us. And then basically, our job is to make sure that you know all the latest ones. Okay, so this one's going to be recorded. So I'm I'm glad you're here live, but I'm actually doing it also so I can record it so that we can post it in the back office for so people who could not make it then uh, they can. Uh, uh, they could watch it, and then, of course, new agents, as they come in, they can always use this contract to refer to it. So this is the purchase agreement uh, training on the latest purchase agreement. I Now, I printed everything out for everyone as well, so as you're taking the class, you could uh, go ahead and fill this in. Now, for some of you who've done these purchase agreements before, then it's going to be almost like a fresher class for you because I'm going to be going over the whole purchase agreement, how to fill it out, and so forth. So, so uh if you already know it, great. But if you don't know it, then even better. Okay, so I'm going to pass this out here. And uh, and uh, just take one, pass it down. Put one in your desk already. All right, so the first thing let's go over are the forms for a purchase agreement. Now, obviously, there are many, many forms that are in the uh, in your zip form program, okay? There are many forms in your zip form programs. Now, I am, for those of you who can uh, who can see the screen, and for those of you at home, Okay, um, what I have here are all the forms already pulled up on my zip forms program. Okay, now one of the things that you get when you become a member of the board and the member of MLS is you have a zip forms account. Now the zip forms account that you get is actually a zip form plus account with our company. All right, so not to go way too much to de into de deep into it, all of you should have a Zip Forms Plus account with our company. We are Zip Form Plus members here. Okay, as a company, we pay more every year as a company so you can have it. Not every company that you join will have Zip Forms Plus that you came from. So the, the program that you had when if you were with a different company if you come to our company make sure that you have zip forms plus okay make sense so you should have been given a zip form plus account as you come to our company now um there's so many advantages of a zip forms plus account all right one of the major advantages is that when you have zip forms plus when you turn in your file you just have to share your file with us, and we go into your file and audit it right in your file. You understand that? If you don't have Zip Form Plus, let's say you're with a company that does not have Zip Form Plus, when you turn in your file, you actually have to print everything out and then physically walk your file to the office, or uh, if you have to, or you have to print it out, scan it every single file and send it to us, right? Like for example, some companies, they'll use uh, a, a transaction management program. Some places use like a SkySlope. Have you ever done with, have dealt with that before, SkySlope? Well, you know that SkySlope, you have to actually 
upload everything, like every single document onto Sky Slope, right? So you have a disclosure. Well, in a transaction, there's 20 different disclosures, right? Contract, there's addendums, there's counter offers, there's, there's this form, that form. Imagine having every single form, you have to go and download it. Does that make sense? And you, I mean, you have to upload it and then you have to send each form in and, and attach it to your sky slope. You know, that's a big hassle on a transaction. That's a huge hassle. With zip form plus, so you will know, you already have everything on the computer. So when you have zip form plus, all you do is click share. And then once you share the file with auditing, we go right into your file. We just audit it from there. You don't have to upload anything. You don't have to print, upload anything. Everything is be paperless. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? So that's how we do it, okay, at our company. Another thing that's awesome is that when you're in zip form plus, there's so much functionality in there. What I mean by functionality is, is with zip forms plus, one of the things you could do in there, and I'm not going to train you on it today, but we have zip forms trainers come in to train you all the time, is that you can set, uh, you can set, uh, what you call, um, I, I forgot the name of that. Uh, it's, there's official way, but you, basically you set up default files. Okay, so let's say it's this is my default purchase agreement my purchase file, a oh, templates. Yeah, that's the word. I, yeah, I just couldn't think about it. You set up templates for yourself. So this is your buyer's template. This is your seller listing template. Once you set up a template, all the forms that you want is, a, is and you click on the template, all the forms that you need for that come up. Does that make sense? All the forms you need for that come up. Set up a listing template. All your files you need for listings come up. And a lot of the things are pre-filled in for you already. Does it make sense? Okay. So you can set up templates. Okay. Another very powerful tool in ZipForms Plus is that if you're, let's say, you're um, doing uh, uh, any kind of transaction, you can actually link your uh, link all your forms with the actual property and MLS number. So then it will auto-populate everything that has to do with the property right into your contract. Does that make sense? So there, you don't have mistakes typing stuff in. Like APN numbers, everything is automatically linked to it. Okay? So that's just some tips on Zip Form Plus that, uh, and, and some advantages and why we use it and why it's so much better. Okay. So, so I am in my Zip Forms Plus account right now. Okay? I'm in it right now. All right? And so uh, hopefully you all know how to get to where I got to, okay? When you're in your Zip Forms Plus program, it's going to ask you if you want to create a new transaction. Now, I, since it's already done for me, I already have the forms that you have in front of you already. I'm not going to go back, okay? So hopefully everyone will already know how to at least get started by creating a, a new contract, okay? Now, as you come in, just grab one of these, okay? I'll put it here at the corner right here, okay? All right. So, so what I've done, let me see, go back, okay. So I've already, I've already picked, okay? I've already picked a, a new transaction, okay? And now I'm in my documents area, of my zip forms plus program i'm in my documents area of my zip forms plus program okay i've already chosen the residential purchase agreement and and so from this area how you see what forms you have if you go to the far right hand corner of your zip forms plus program you'll see that the california association of realtors has a library of forms okay has a library of forms. In this case, if I scroll down, the form that we're training on today is the residential purchase agreement. Okay, is the residential purchase agreement. Okay, in which I've already picked. Okay, when I click on the residential purchase agreement, this document, okay, this document actually is a whole package of documents, okay?
that I've printed out for you, okay? So let's go through the residential purchase agreement and its attachments, okay? So we're gonna go through that first, and then I'm gonna show you how to fill it in, okay? And, and what things are and what things to look for, all right? So hopefully by the end of class today, you will have this as a reference so that you will know what to look for and what when you're writing up a purchase agreement. Okay, so let's go through the forms here, okay? All right, let's go through the forms here. The first one, the first form here is a disclosure regarding the real estate agency relationship, okay? This is a, in short, this is called our agency disclosure. All right, you will always need the disclosure, okay? This disclosure basically has information regarding your duties as an agent if you represented the seller, your duties as an agent if you represented the buyer, your duties for both buyer and seller if you represented both, okay? All right? In this, how you'd fill it in, it's quite easy, okay? All right, let's say in this case we're representing a buyer. So I'm just gonna represent John Smith, okay? And let's say we also have Mary Smith. I would just simply put their information in. Now, I when you first start your transaction, when you first start your transaction, you could actually fill in the addresses name of the your buyers in that uh, opening screen when you first started. And then when you do that, then that information would be on here already. But in this case, I didn't do that yet, okay? Because I wanna have everyone see what I'm doing here, so I'm just doing it right from this screen, okay? So in this case, I'm representing John Smith, Mary Smith. They're both buyers, okay? They're both buyers, okay? All right, the firm is Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, okay? Elite Real Estate, okay? So that's, our, that's the full name of our company. I'd like you to put the full name in there, please. Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, Elite Real Estate, okay? 01525946. That's our license number, 01525946. Right? Now, as we're doing this, if you'd like, go ahead and start filling the contract out that you have for the people who are here. Feel free and start filling it out by hand. Okay? As we're doing this, feel free to start filling out by hand. That's the very first page right there. Okay? Everything's in this order, okay? So start filling it out by hand. So you guys get used to doing it, okay? All right, so so as we're doing it, you might want to start filling out by hand, okay? John Smith, Mary Smith, Berkshire Hathaway Home Service, Elite Real Estate, okay? And in this area, I, I'd like you to go ahead and put your name. My name is Robert Doe, okay? And my license number, 0119-8809. So, see, as you can see, my license number is different than the company's license number. I've seen people make a mistake and put their license number where it says the company license number. Does that make sense? Okay, so at our company, we have a company license number, and then we have your license number. In this case, all right, in this case, you need to have both the company's license number and your license number, okay? As we're auditing files, my staff sometimes come to me and say, hey, Robert, this has, <laughs> you know, the, the, their agent's number as the company number. Okay, so again, our company license number, you can write this down, 0152-5946. 0152-5946. Five nine four six. That's our company's license number. Okay, and then and then on the bottom there would be your license number. Now, 
I want you, now I, I just have the boilerplate here with our company, but typically right here, you would have created a profile for yourself, okay? And in there would have your information on the bottom of the profile, okay? So in the purchase agreement, you'd have your profile uh, and the company's address and everything on here. Make sure that when you are, make sure that when you are, um, uh, writing up your contract, that is your information. What happens is, is sometimes if you've changed from a new broker and we're your new broker, your old information is still there. Okay. So make sure that as you're writing it up, you have your current information on there, please. Does it make sense? Yes. Yes. Questions. Is that on zip form or is it on zip? Zip forms plus. Now, remember, zip forms is the program you get from the SAR. Zip Forms Plus account is the Zip Forms version that we give to you as you join the company. That makes sense? Okay, so make sure that you have our company's Zip Forms Plus program that we provide to you. Uh, if you ask how, did, how do you get it, Linda, how do we get them their Zip Forms Plus pro account? Yeah, either our auditor or Linda will do it and give it to you, okay? So make sure you have Zip Forms Plus, not the Zip Forms that everyone has. We give you Zip Forms Plus, okay? All right. The next form is the second page of the agency disclosure, okay? All right. All right. Now, on the second page of the agency disclosure, this is where you are confirming, okay? This is where you are confirming, all right, okay, uh, and, and this is just a sample, so you don't have to complete this out. This is just, this is not to do not complete, this sample, but this would be where you would confirm uh, uh, if you represent both buyer and seller, but then you'd be doing it on the actual purchase agreement, okay? You'll be actually doing it on the purchase agreement, all right. So the next form is possible representation of more than one buyer or seller. Disclosure and consent. All right. This is a form. And as you can see here, you see here, now as I'm typing it in, the fields are now auto-populated as I typed it in. I did not have to type it in again, okay? This next form is called the possible representation of more than one buyer or seller, disclosure and consent. Okay. What this form is for, because I want everyone, when you're explaining it, you, you got to sort of explain it correctly. Is this form is just a disclosure that says that sometimes, you know, even though I'm writing this offer up for you, you know, I, I could have another client who might be interested in the same property or our company could have another buyer who's interested in the same property and, and there's another offer coming in as well, okay? Just so you know, okay? All right? And this is also a consent letting you know that if I listed one property, it doesn't mean that your listing could be my only listing. I could be listing other properties and accepting offers on those properties as well. That, that's just letting you know that as a professional, you know, I, that could be the case. But, but if I ever have any kind of relationship that might cause a conflict of interest, I will definitely disclose that to you. And then, and then at that point in time, you know, I could get another agent to come help me so we no longer have a conflict of interest, okay? So so, uh, so this is just a disclosure that says that, all right? So on the bottom, again, it's already filled in with John Smith and Mary Smith, uh, our company and our license number, uh, your name. So your name obviously isn't Robert Doe. So in yours, put your name and your license number. Don't just copy this and put my name and my license number because this is your contract, okay? Make sense? All right. Uh, next one. Okay, now for property address, in this case, the property address is not my building. Okay, so I'm just gonna put one, two, three, four Main Street. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna put here in the city of Sacramento, in the state of California, and I'll put in the 95828 zip code. As I update that, it will update on here, okay? 
So this is just a wire fraud electronic funds transfer advisory. Okay. This just uh, basically says, you know, uh, you can, uh, your ability to conduct business electronically is conveniently uh, as part of our lives, you know, and, and um, uh, it just tells you be careful where you wire your funds and so forth. And, and, that, and that's just a disclosure. Okay. So I'm going to move on from that. All right, so I'm going to get right into our purchase agreement and how to fill out uh, our new purchase agreement appropriately and correctly, okay? Now, this is important for everyone because as I'm showing you how to fill out the purchase agreement, I'm going to give comments on what to watch for and what is uh, and, and, and what things that are important in the purchase agreement, okay? And, 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 and things that I think would be uh, crucial when you're handling a transaction, okay? So the first one is the date prepared. This is not the date that the offer was accepted, but this is actually a very important date, okay? Because um, this is the date that on counter offers and many of your other offers, you're going to refer to this day, okay? Okay. What I mean by that is that, you know, sometimes on counter offers and on addendums, you are referring to the contract prepared on a certain date, right? For, for experienced agents, you know what I'm talking about, right? There's a part in a lot of the other forums that said, contract prepared on what date? And that's the one you're referring to, right? This is the date that they want on there. It's not the date it was accepted. It's the date that it was prepared. So when you refer to the contract that was prepared on a certain date, this is the contract that was prepared on the 26th. Okay, so if you ever refer back to anything, that's the date you refer back to. So that's an important date, okay? Because that's the date that this contract was prepared, prepared on that date. Yes, Susan, question. So wouldn't that be the important date too? Because a lot of times you have three days to respond to the offer. Yeah, yeah, it's important because that's the date it was prepared. And you'll see in a lot of forums referring to the contract prepared on that date, okay? Not accepted, but prepared, okay? So remember that date. All right. So now let's go through the offer here. This contract, okay? And, and then please, Gadwin, as you come in, if you came in late, we have uh, the contract right there, okay? All right. So now this is an offer from John Smith, Mary Smith, okay? Now let me give you a little note on that. In this case, the offer is from individuals, okay, or from individuals. Sometimes the offer may actually come from uh, a, an entity. Does it make sense? So if the offer came from an entity, you would put the name of the entity here, but then you would need to include, okay, a different form, okay? The form that you need to include is a representative capacity addenda, okay? It's a representative capacity signature disclosure. It's called an RCSD form, all right? So that's just a little information is remember, if you, so, and, and how you add the form is you just click on it, and now the form was added to the file to be used later. So, so in, and this is what the form looks like. It's just a representative capacity sit, the disclosure, okay? I'm going to go back to my forms and go back to the, the one that I was working in, okay? All right? So just as a little note, when you write a purchase agreement, if there is uh, just two individuals, then you just do it the way I just did, okay? John Smith, Mary Smith. If there's a third person, I could put, you know, Sue Smith, okay, like that. All right, a third person, and then, and then, and these people will be in there like that, okay? But in this case, I'm just gonna go ahead and just keep it as two people, all right? Okay, John Smith, Mary Smith. But if ever you're writing an offer on behalf of an entity, then you need that other form, representative capacity form. Make sense? LLC, a trust, an, uh, a corporation, okay, just any entity. You guys got it? 
we we don't have that part of here, right? We have the form. No, here is the first thing. No, the form. I just, I just, I just pull it up <laughs> right here. I, I just added the form. No, no, no. The form's not in your packet. The form is something that's on your Win One forms. Okay. I just wanted to add that. That's all. Okay. So let's keep moving forward. Obviously, the address is there. One, two, three, four Main Street. Okay. City. Okay. Now, in this case, ask for the county. I'll, I'll put Sacramento County in there. Okay, parcel number, I'll type in one, two, three, four, five, six, zero, zero, one. Okay, okay, I, I put in the parcel number in there. All right, so next place is how much you want to offer. So in this case, let's go ahead and offer 400,000. Okay, right there, 400,000. Okay, now, next one, item number D, is we're putting shall, escrow shall occur on. Now, here's the thing that I... Normally recommend when you're writing up a purchase agreement is you could either A, click this box and put an exact date you want to close escrow on, or B, put in a number of days after acceptance. I would always recommend just put in a number of days after acceptance. The reason why is I've seen people pick a specific date to close on and it took them 10 days to come into agreement. Does that make sense? Yes? It's like, okay, we want to close 30 days from the day I wrote this offer. But then it took 10 days to come into agreement. You're in that counter offer, offer stage. And all of a sudden, you didn't just realize that just getting accepted took you 10 days. And now you're, you're entering in an escrow, a 20-day escrow. Does that make sense? So I normally would just check this box. And I would put, okay, 30 days to close. Now, the standard closing time is normally 30 to 35 days. FHA is normally around 45 days to close. It normally takes a little longer to get an FHA transaction closed than a normal conventional closing. Uh, in our office, if you go with in-house lending, we've closed deals as soon as 17 days. Okay? So I would recommend asking on a normal conventional loan. Uh, anywhere from 30 to 35 days, okay? If you want to make your offer seem stronger, you might just put 30 days, okay, which is pretty common, all right? But but in reality, don't uh, – if if they don't have a ton of offers and, and they have – they're in a – they're not in a multiple situation and you sort of know it and you ask for feedback from the agent, then 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 I would I would possibly ask for 35 days. FHA definitely ask for 60, I mean, 45 days. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Questions? But when you, when you confirm with the lender. Yeah. Good. And, and a and very good comment is you always want to confirm with your lender. How soon can you close? Can you make that 30 day deadline? If you can't, then ask for a little bit more time. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So in this case, I'll ask for 30. This is already X in there that says disclosure regarding real estate agency relationship is included. And that was the first form that we saw. Okay. All right. So now this is as we're writing the offer. Okay. Uh, there is an area for uh, the, the, the listing side of things. Okay. The listing side of things. All right. Now this information can be found on MLS. All right. Uh, so you could put that in there. If you left it off, eventually you'd have to fill it in. OK. But uh, in this case, let's say the selling firm was let's say the selling firm in this case was Lion, Lion Real Estate or Keller Williams or whatever. And the agent was, you know, Linda, Linda, Linda. Linda, whatever, Linda, Linda Lee. Okay. All right. And in this case, uh, Lion is representing the seller. Okay. And then Berkshire Hathaway, in this case, is representing the buyer as a buyer's agent. And then you put their number, their license number in there. Okay. You put their license number in there. Okay. As you're writing it up. Okay. Yes. Yes. You, you alluded to it earlier 
with the new MLS link or, or search function, it'll pop, populate all that for you. Yeah. One iteration back, it didn't populate the um, brokerage for the listing side, mm -hmm. but you still have to do the check marks for like, which side you're. Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, when you link it with the MLS, it should auto populate listing agents information, everything, but it's not going to auto check the boxes. Who's representing who that's up for you to check. Okay. So you want to make sure that in this case you check buyer, buyer's agent, and then you check the whatever other company for seller. Okay. And that's what you would do there. All right. Now the next item is uh, the deposit. You know, there's a lot of debate on how much should you ever put as a deposit, okay? You know what my answer to you as to how much to put as a deposit, okay? My answer to you is put a deposit as, as low as the seller is comfortable with it. You know, the... I don't want any I don't want anyone to get your client to put a massive deposit and then get into a situation of a possible breach and losing their deposit. Some agents get so excited about getting this offer accepted, they they ask their own client to put a pretty hefty deposit. Okay? When you offer 5000 over the asking price, or the full price or whatever you offer, you know, I don't think the difference between you putting a $5,000 deposit versus you putting a $2,000 deposit makes that much of a difference on the final sales price. The sales price is the sales price. But if this deal goes bad and later on they're trying to fight to get their $10,000 deposit back, then it, it, it all becomes a big headache. Does it make sense? All right. I've seen agents before ask their clients to put a pretty hefty deposit and the agent then has a hard time because, of course, if the seller sees a big hefty deposit, they want to keep it. And the buyer might be buying the property and then they might have either A, didn't qualify for the loan or had to change a heart. And now they're having a hard time getting their deposit back. They might actually cancel for a very legitimate reason and seller decides not to give the deposit back. Does that make sense? And now sellers for uh, negotiating for a portion of the deposit. So I would rather see you put less of a deposit for your client. If it goes through, great. All right. Then way more of a deposit, okay? Well, so if, it, if it's too low, they ask you. To yeah, well, that's fine. Let them counter back. Increase your deposit. Let them counter it. Yeah. Then don't put a one thousand dollar deposit. Yeah. Yeah, it makes you look cheap. But at the same time, I've seen people offer on a three hundred thousand dollar home and have the deposit be eighty thousand dollars. Yeah. 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 And one time the client canceled and 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 the agent was so new uh -huh. that she told the client that if you cancel, you can't get your deposit back. They forfeited the 80000 from a different company. I looked at that. It almost blew me away. I'm pretty sure the seller will keep it. Yeah. And it was only on like a $400,000 property. $80,000 deposit on a $400,000 property. And the reason why, and you know the reason why they canceled is because they couldn't qualify for the loan. And they never removed the loan contingency. But when the when the when the cancellation came in, you know, the agent was so new, she was a rookie. She she was so new that she told the client, if you can, if you can't close on a deal, you lose your deposit. And then the buyer signed releasing the eighty thousand. Even though, just so you know, even though just so you know, they never even removed their loan contingency. But, she didn't even know it even existed. What? We can even we have a deposit there, but we didn't do the final part through. We can back out. No, you can't. Yeah, you can't. Where you get that from? Someone did it, and they get their deposit back. No, there has to be a reason. The only reason that you would have in your final walkthrough is if there was something material they found at the final walkthrough. 
if they found something at the final walkthrough that was materially different than when they first went into contract, then yes, you could cancel. Okay. It has to, the only reason for a final walkthrough is to find something that's materially different. You understand the word materially different? Okay. Well, that might not even be that material. You know, the material is, is that, is that, is that, you know, there are all these holes in the walls that are hidden by frames and you come back and you see all these holes in the walls and all this stuff. And, and, and yeah, that's a material different, you know, but, but if it's normal wear and tear outside of normal wear and tear, then that's not a material difference. Yeah. No, the deposit is whatever you want to write in there. Yeah. So, so I mean, in this, in this day and age, I would, I would keep it at around a thousand, two thousand dollars. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I would keep it there. A two hundred thousand dollar home, thousand dollar deposit—that's plenty, you know. Four hundred thousand dollar home, you know, a couple thousand dollars is fine, you know. I, I would not, and 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 so when that, and then that agent showed me, and I said, oh my god, you know, good thing you weren't with my company when you did that, you know. <laughs> you know, good thing you weren't with my company when you did that. No, a seller will never be able to keep someone's deposit, even if it's a legitimate reason. The, the deposit is held by the title company, and they're a neutral third party. Legitimate or not, they will never release the deposit without instructions from both buyer and seller. Okay? Even if a seller, uh, even if the buyer straight out breached the contract. They removed all their contingencies and they decided to simply change their mind. Okay. It doesn't mean that that seller can just take the deposit. There's no such thing. Okay. The buyer will still have to give instructions to the title company to release that deposit. If there is no agreement between buyer and seller, then, then that's some, that's something that has to be uh, handled uh, either in some kind of court, okay, or some type of mediation between the buyer and seller. But instructions have to come from both buyer and seller in order for a title company to release the deposit, okay? Regardless if it's legitimate or not. Now, would that, would that case say the advice where it's coming from a buyer who's been the selling agent, right? And so the buyer, the potential buyer, lost their, their deposit with the reinforcement come back on. No, uh, ask the question again. So say like they lost their, I gave you advice to release, you know, your deposit and stuff like that, right? So you gave your buyer the advice to release your deposit to the seller because of? The $80,000 you got from the buyer. Now I'm the buyer, I, I come back and yeah. you gave me false advice. Yeah, of course, that, that, that'd be the fault of the agent. In this case, it was 100% their fault, you know, 100% their fault. Usually, if it happens, I use the contingency on a proven lot, and I agree with Yeah, I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Well, let's keep moving forward. I, I, I have to actually keep my watch here in front of me so I, I can keep moving on. Okay. So in this case, we're gonna put a deposit at two thousand dollars. So I need to be able to finish this whole contract by the end of the two-hour period. Okay. All right. And then in this case, I'll, I'll click on personal check. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, there is two items on the deposit that I need to explain to everyone. Item number one is buyer direct deposit directly with escrow holder within three days. Option two is buyer deposit with agent and has given agent deposit by personal check to the agent submitting the offer. At our company, we do not allow for option two. We only allow for option one. Okay? This wasn't here before, but now with this updated contract, it's in here. At our company, I'm going to repeat again. We do not allow for option two. We only allow option one. Okay, what that means is, option one is, that the deposit check 
of two thousand dollars, okay, is going to be kept with the client. We are only going to keep a a copy of the deposit to send with an with our offer to show that to show that there was a deposit that was made that, that, that a check that was made for a deposit, and that check, if the offer is accepted, will be delivered to the title company within three days, business days after acceptance, okay? We, by buyer, buyer, we will never, us, we will not keep and hold their deposit check. Option two is they give us the deposit check. We make a copy for them to keep. And then we hang on to their check in our wallets or in our purses or at the office at the risk of losing it. And then when it's accepted, we are the ones to drive it down to the title company. I do not allow for option two. Okay. Guys get it? Yes. We Only option one. Okay. You never hold their checks. Okay. All right. One time I left the hundred thousand dollar check in the in the in the tax machine. Yeah. In the printer, and they didn't write down even title company on it. Yeah. So, so someone find it. Yeah. I thought the big mistake. Yeah, it was a big mistake. I remember that. Okay. No, one time I accident. He were, he had the client because you know he deals a lot of big break properties. One hundred thousand dollar check signed by the client without even the word title company on it. Anyone could have just gotten it, put their name on it, just deposit it. You know what I'm saying? That's why we don't handle people's checks. You guys understand that? Okay? We do not handle people's checks. Okay? They give us a check. We make a copy. We give it right back to them. You guys understand that? When it's ready and it's accepted, they can wire the funds there. They could bring the check there. Whatever they want to do, they can do that, but not us. Does that make sense? Okay, not us, all right? So we check that box, we move forward, okay? Uh, item number B here is if only there's an increased deposit. In this case, we don't really deal with increased deposits. So I'm gonna skip that portion here. C is if this is an all cash offer, you would mark the box C if it's an all cash offer. So if if the your offer is 398,000, or 400,000 and it's all cash, you would just check this box all cash and you're good. If there's a loan involved, okay, all right, but if you do check all cash, okay, all right, either A, you send, submit the offer with the proof of funds or within three days or whatever days, you will deliver proof of funds. Okay, there's a reason why this is important, okay? And when doing the contract, I'm gonna explain to everyone something. You do not wanna give the other side a loophole to canceling your offer. You guys understand that? As I'm teaching you this contract, I'm gonna teach you the loopholes too. For better or for worse, it's good to know the loopholes. If you're representing seller and you know the loopholes, there's a lot of times I can get you out of a contract, okay? And for buyer, there's a lot of times I can help you cancel a contract if you know the loopholes. So when doing these contracts, if you understand the loopholes, you're in a very powerful position if you know the loopholes. One loophole is in a cash offer. You normally have to deliver a cash offer with proof of funds, okay? If for some reason you forget to deliver proof of funds, and they send you a notice to perform and you don't perform, they can cancel on you and take another offer. Okay? All right? So in this case, if you're writing a cash offer, you can submit the cash offer with proof of funds or you check the box and you have to provide proof of funds after. Okay? But a cash offer needs to have proof of funds. Yeah, it looks good when you send it with the offer. But you need, but when you send proof, proof of funds with the offer, you should black out important information like account numbers.
Don't black out the names because they don't know if it's from your client, but black out account numbers and so forth and you can send it proof of funds. Make sense? Okay, all right. So in this case, we're not gonna write cash though. We're gonna do it with a loan. Okay, now, when you are submitting an offer with a loan, you need to put the financing terms in the loan or the general financing terms with your offer. The reason you have to put general finance terms in the offer is because later on, if your clients cancel because they couldn't get the loan and you don't put any finance terms, a tough seller could say, well, I could have done the loan for the client. So I'm not going to accept their cancellation because it doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like they they should have been disqualified. Does that make sense? So for the loan, okay, let's say the, the loan is conventional. Conventional is the standard. If it's FHA, you would click FHA. If it's VA, you would click VA, okay? Now, when I clicked on FHA, automatically the FHA, a mandatory clause, uh, was included, was added to this, okay? All right? If I click it off, then the clause will be taken off. So this, this form, in a way, is a smart form. Depending on what you check, sometimes there are forms that will be added to your form because it's a form that's needed if you did that type of transaction. And this is part of the Zip Forms Plus program that we have. Does that make sense? Okay. So in this case, I'm just going to go with conventional financing. Okay. All right. And I'm going to put in here, this loan will not exceed... Let's say if the loan, uh, if, if the prequal letter was at 4%, or let's say it was at 4.5, then you have to put in there that it's not going to exceed 4.5. Because if the rates change, if the rates change, and the rate just really took a big, like let's say something happened, feds raised the rate, your client was getting a loan for 4.5%, all of a sudden the rates go to 5.5%, your clients may not qualify anymore. If you leave this blank, then you don't give your clients the option, really the room to disqualify themselves. That makes sense? So that's why you would put the 4.5% in there and then not exceed one point or uh, whatever your client's paying. If they're paying zero points, and put zero points in there. So at least you put, at least you have, and zero, but you just leave it blank. But let's say one point, then you put one in there. Okay, what... Um, Basically, what that means is that you're setting the parameters for the loan your client is getting, okay? You might think it's a small issue, but when it comes down later on, if there is a dispute between, you know, uh, between why they didn't close, that could, that could be the deal breaker right there, okay? All right. And then finally, this is the loan amount. If they're putting 20% down on this $400,000 uh, purchase, then their loan amount in this case would be $320,000. Okay, so see, I put it there. Once I put three hundred twenty thousand dollars, the the down payment will automatically be here at seventy eight thousand dollars. Why is it only seventy eight thousand dollars here? Because we already gave the two thousand. Makes sense. They have to bring the remaining seventy eight. Okay, all right. So let's move on. You could, you could, um, if you. And, and basically, basically over here, uh, what he's saying is if you want, you could ask for, for closing costs. If, if let's say you're working with an FHA buyer, just a buyer in general, and they have a little bit of shortage on funds, this is where you could put in there additional financing terms, a seller to credit, buyer, $5,000 towards closing cost. Whatever, okay? Sometimes you'll see the term uh, NRCC, NRCC, which is non recurring closing cost, which is, you know, like, you know, the, the, uh, the things like uh, the, the title fees and the escrow fee and so forth, like that, NRCC. Or you just put closing costs and whatever, you know, I mean, so that, that's where you put that, you know. In this case, that's where you put it. Seller, credit buyer, $5,000 towards closing the cost. No, no, Man. Sometimes I end up writing 5000 but I ask back to the buyer. 
Yeah, you can do that. I mean, you can do whatever. No, not the best way. There's no best way to go. It's, you just have to read the seller, you know? Okay. But I remember, Manjinder, you got caught in this one time. Manjinder got caught one time. Remember that time you got caught and you end up losing your whole commission? Yes. Okay. See, I run into this stuff all the time. So as I'm teaching this, I remember the mistakes that people make. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to show you. So he ended up giving his whole commission up at the end of the deal. It was like $15,000. I think that client gave me business back again, but he told his client that he has with someone else. Yeah. So don't compromise the commission with anyone. Okay. So check this out. There's two areas that when you're writing an offer or reviewing an offer that you could oversee. Right here, sometimes you're you're trying to go so fast that someone slips in their seller to credit buyer five thousand towards closing costs. Okay, and if you're representing the seller, you forget to see that you didn't explain that to the seller, then it's going to come out of your commission. In this case, Manjinder got caught on his transaction right here. Other terms and conditions. There's an area. You know, didn't hide it. It was there clearly. <laughs> okay, well, you're not supposed to look at the, all the pages. You only look at the front two pages. You're in trouble. Okay. So, so you can type it here too. You know, seller to credit buyer. Okay, credit buyer. $5,000 towards closing costs. See that? It could also sit here too. As long as it sits in the contract, okay, the you know they're gonna have to see it. And then my buyer, I was trying to work for him, backed out because they wouldn't pay all those clothes. I said, I'll I'll take it out of my commission. He still wouldn't do it. All right. So, anyways, sometimes you get too aggressive. Okay, so anyways, um, seller, credit buyer, closing costs. Now, now this normally is to help for some of their loan fees, okay? But that's where you can put it, okay? So let's go to the second page. Bearable case of down payment and closing costs. Uh, within three days, even if it's not a cash offer, uh, you will need to provide a uh, a verification that the buyer has enough money to close for those clients who get a loan you click here verification attached okay and you submit the offer with a pre-approval letter but the pre-approval letter has to have the words I have verified that they have enough funds to close like if you use like uh, any loan officer you use and sometimes your clients will use a loan officer. The letter provided to the client should always have the verbiage, okay, that they reviewed and that the client has enough funds to close, okay? Sometimes they just say this client's pre-qualified, but there's no mention of enough sufficient funds to close. So we need the loan approval letter or a pre-qual letter to have the words that I've reviewed, okay, okay, that I've reviewed the, I've reviewed the, uh, the, 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 the bank statements and the clients have enough funds to close, okay? All right. Okay, okay. All right. So if you do provide a prequal letter that has that, make sure that you uh, make sure that you uh, clicked on the box verification is attached. Okay. All right. Next one uh, is the appraisal contingency. You never check this box. Is not contingent. Okay. Normally, contracts already have contingencies built in. C contracts already have contingencies. Thank you. 
built into the contract. The appraisal contingency is one of them, okay? So I've had people accidentally remove the appraisal contingency, okay? Okay? Huh? Yeah, then, then if it's a cash offer, then you don't need it, but I wouldn't remove it. I would just leave it there, okay? Um, okay. All right, next is the next contingency you have is a loan contingency, okay? Loan contingency is very important, okay, in your contract. The reason the loan contingency is very important in your contract is because if you can't get the loan, you're allowed to cancel. Does that make sense? Okay. The default for the loan contingency is 21 days. All right. Uh, you'd only check this box, no loan contingency, if you there's no loan at all. Okay. If it's a cash deal, then there's no loan contingency. Okay. But if we were for 30 days, we need to it. It is, it is good for us to back out in some way. That's right. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't do that. You know, I mean, you could ask or and put 30 day loan contingency. It'll make your offer look a little weaker. Okay. And just so you know, normally within 21 days, you'll know if you're getting the loan or not. Okay. You'll, you'll, you'll know. So, so, so I, I think you're okay with the 21 day default. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Next. Okay, sale of buyer's property. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit here. Okay, give me a second here. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> All right, um, uh, in this case, the next, the next area is item number 4A or 4B. Now, I'm not going to go into this in depth because I'm, I am running out of time. I only have an hour left to go over this contract. But item number 4B, you only check that box if the buyer is buying this property contingent on selling their home. Okay? If the buyer is buying this property contingent on selling their home, then you would click on this box, open up the all forms, and add a buyer contingency form. Okay? 4B, but, right? Yeah, 4B. But in this case... If if the buyer is not buying the property contingent, then just then don't mark anything. A is the default. Okay, all right. So item number five is if you're adding any kind of addendums. Okay. <clears throat> For example, sometimes you'll write up an offer, but you'll add an addendum. For to if you don't have enough space on other terms and conditions, and you're adding an addendum to add some stuff in there. Then, then you. This is where you would click on this box, and you'd add addendum one. Okay, an addendum would be would be specifying certain things to agree upon up front. Okay, uh, you know, uh, if um, if uh, if this was a probate sale and needs a court confirmation, if this is a a, a short sale, then uh, then you'd need a short sale addendum. Okay, if it's a probate, then you put a probate advisory. So this is only uh, this is only if you're adding other addendum. That's all. Okay. No, 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 not today. Next time. Okay. All right. So I can move forward. Okay. So let's go. Um, number six is if you're adding any other terms and conditions. Okay. If you're adding any other terms and conditions. <laughs> You know, other terms and conditions could be uh, could be things like um, things like spa to stay with the property, spa to stay with the property. Okay, whatever you know, spa to stay with the property. You know, uh, you know, uh, you know, window coverings, window coverings, coverings to stay. Okay, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, all right. Now, I want everyone to be very careful of something, okay? I want everyone to be very careful of something when you're writing up offers, okay? Okay. Whatever is offered on MLS is not what is automatically on your purchase agreement. So, 
in MLS, it would say spa and jacuzzi and and uh, and, and 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 spa room to to include in the property or beautiful spa, fifteen thousand dollars spa. You know, play set is a rainbow play set, fifteen thousand dollars rainbow play set, whatever it is. And you see it all advertised, and you'll see even things like five thousand dollars bonus to selling agent. All this kind of stuff in MLS, okay? But I'm going to tell you right now: if you don't put it in the contract, it doesn't. It, it, then, then basically, the end result is it doesn't stay. And if they're if they're good-hearted and kind-hearted, they'll leave it. If not, they'll take it and sell it on eBay or Craigslist. And 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 I'm I'm going to tell you I'm going to let you know that right now, as a professional agent, you know. If, if there's something in the home that your clients really like, I've seen people have these beautiful window coverings on these nice homes. And, and later on, they, they come to the home and the window coverings are gone and you never asked for those window coverings. Is it, if it's attached like that, isn't it? Well, I mean, but, it, but, but, but some, but, but, you know, the, the, the the what you call it the, the drapes and stuff like that sometimes are just they're, they're just draped on you know they're not attached no 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 you can't replace a chandelier though yeah yeah okay so so i'm i'm, I'm letting you know that i've seen plenty of spas in my day get taken even though in the advertising remarks beautiful spa but if you don't ask for the spa in your contract, they could take it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. the, the yeah, they're, 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 they're offering it on MLS. It doesn't mean what you got. And I've seen agents give up $10,000 uh, bonuses when they don't add the bonus. Does that make sense? They don't add the bonus. So just put it in there. If, you, if you, your client likes it, just put it right in there. Okay, let's put it right in there. Okay, okay. All right. So that's the next part. Please leave your message. Okay. Hey Tim, can you do me a favor? Call Sir Juden. Tell him that I'm losing my uh, connection here, so that. So that so that the people who are online can watch the thing. Okay. All right. So next inspections. Okay. This is an important part of the contract because this part, okay, this part talks about the allocation of cost. Allocation of cost. Okay. Okay. It talks about the allocation of cost. Now. Now, in this section, there's boxes where ask buyer or seller to pay for certain things. Linda, can you see if um, I'm losing my connection a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the first one uh, for allocation of costs is the natural hazard disclosure, the NHD. Okay. So in this case, the the NHD and then make sure check again and make sure this is all recorded okay okay um and this is being recorded already you click on it okay okay well it's losing the signal it's not coming back and it's saying losing the signal all right so in this case seller normally pays the NHD okay all right uh click here to pick a service provider no um uh, over here at our company, uh, who do we use for NHD? Uh, Homecode, Homeguard. Property, I'm thinking property. Yeah, property ID. Okay, or disclosure source. You can just pick it here. Yeah. Okay, whoever. Okay, whoever you want to use, whoever treats you well. Okay. All right. So then you click here. In this case, uh, I'll scroll down here and uh, and pick uh, disclosure source, whatever. Okay. All right. Uh, and then it has a couple of blanks, a couple of blanks. Now, in this case, there are a couple of other uh, reports that normally I would recommend. 
one of them being a termite report. Termite report. And I would ask the seller to pay for a termite report. Okay. Uh, I would put in here seller's choice. Choice. Okay. Now, there used to be this form. Okay. There used to be this form. And let me see if they still, this latest update. Okay. This latest update. Uh, And maybe you guys have been writing offers lately. Have you seen the, the termite form? Have you guys seen the termite form lately? No, actually, so the, we, we put it here in a, yeah. in a, beach, you know, a seller. Yeah. Inspection or anything. Okay. Um, there used to be the form. I don't know why they took the form out. But in this case, um, uh, in this case, um, I would, I, I would basically put it right here. No, 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 I know that. Okay. But what I'm talking about is the termite clearance. If you represent, I'm just telling you, if you ever represent an FHA or VA buyer, they normally ask for section one termite clearance. Does it make sense? Okay. All right. Um, and because they asked for Section 1 termite clearance, you know, I would go to item number D, other costs. Okay. And type in their uh, seller to pay, shall pay for Section 1, Section 1 termite clearance. And I type it in right there, section one termite clearance, right there. Okay. Because D has an area for uh, uh, extra items seller shall pay for. So I would I would go to section two here because these are for reports. And then ask for a termite report. And over here, you could also ask for like a, a roof inspection or whatever it is, okay? But, um, but uh, I would ask for a termite report for seller's choice, but then on uh, something like a, an FHA, okay, on an FHA, okay, on an FHA transaction, I would definitely ask uh, here, number D8, section one termite clearance, especially if you're doing an FHA loan, okay? And then, and, and maybe even convent, uh, 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 huh? VA. FHA or VA, okay? All right. Did you say VA? VA, FHA or VA loan. Where to put what? Oh, D, D8, D8. Yeah, okay. All right, let's go. And then uh, government retrofit, I asked seller to pay for that, okay? To make sure that the home has smoke alarm and carbon monoxide and water heater bracing. It's it's the law. But, but I would ask the seller to make sure that they have that. Okay. What item, item number seven B. Seven B. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Item number seven B. Government requirements. Retrofit. Okay. Seven. All right. Once you done this contract, I like it. You give us the printout. What? I like to keep the printout. No. No, no, no. Just to, I mean, I mean, I'm just showing you how to do it. I know, but I still want to be on it. The printout is right in front of you, right here. That's just why you're just writing it in. As I'm checking it, just check it. I still made the mistake. Okay. No matter what, how long time you are in the business, you still see changes. Okay, I'll consider it. Talk to me later. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Let's keep going, though. I only have uh, another 50 minutes. Okay. Please leave your message. Next one. Next one. Okay. Next one. All right. 
Hey, guys, if you're on my Wi-Fi network right now, if you don't mind uh, getting off the Wi-Fi network for a minute, uh, it just keeps on kicking me off. So the people online, uh, yeah, yeah, people. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. For some reason, I'm going in and out with my Wi-Fi right now. Okay. Okay. So, okay, next. Uh, next item, okay, is escrow and title. Um, if I want to make a strong offer, I would I would agree to share the escrow and title. Okay, so if you ever want to share a fee, you click on both of them. If you ever want to share a fee. But normally the only fee that I have my clients share is the, is the escrow fee. The, I, I normally would have the seller pay the owner's title policy because that's actually the more expensive fee. Because normally when you get a loan, there's an Alta policy that you already pay for. So because of that, I would normally ask the seller to pay for the owner's title policy. I would also ask the seller to pay for these transfer taxes. If there was a homeowner's fee, you know, I, I would just click it anyways. Okay. Or any try to kind of private transfer fees. And then on item number D10, there's an item for you to click to ask for the seller to provide a home warranty. So you could ask like, you know, 450 for a home warranty that covers the AC unit. If there's a pool and spa, it's going to be more than 450. But um, but this is where you would ask for a home warranty, and and normally I always ask for a home warranty, and the, normally the seller will always uh, will always agree to it. Okay, so it's not really that big a deal. Yes. Yeah, I always mark seller. Normally that doesn't come up. I always mark seller. And normally it doesn't come up. A very experienced agent will counter it out. Okay? So I normally mark it. A very experienced agent will counter it out. If you were in my class on listing agreements, I would always tell you to counter it out. Okay, what it means is, is let's say, for example, if uh, the home, if the lender doesn't want to lend money on a home that has plumbing, that's the, uh, the, the, the wrong type of the, the plumbing, right? And so they won't finance the home because it has the Ditech or Kitech plumbing, then, then this is the seller agreeing to... Uh, uh, agreeing to fix some of that retrofit stuff. So if I was representing the seller, I would always counter this stuff out. Okay. If this stuff comes up, then we could deal with it, but I don't want the seller to pre-agree to it. Does it make sense? Okay. Example. If I'm representing seller, anytime a client asks for any kind of repairs in the purchase agreement, I will always counter or put a max on it. Always counter or put a max on it, a limit on it. When when I told you to do that, right? So Tim took my class. Tim took my class immediately after. Uh, immediately after, right, Tim? Immediately after he took my class. Huh? Yeah. So after he took my class, he went and wrote the counter offer to put a limit on repair. And it saved your client how much? 20000 20, We put a limit on $2,500 and the electrical penalty needed to be replaced and that was 3000 Yeah. So they just paid for a portion of the electrical panel and then everything else just went to the house. Yeah. So you always put – so that's the reason – we're very experienced here. So that when we're teaching how to do this, you get a lot of our knowledge, you know. You always counter, but when you write it in, you don't write it in counter. You don't put a cap on yourself. But let's say, for example, you ask for Section One clearance. Well, if the home has termites and the termite eat, ate up all the foundation, there was a deal where it was a it was a hundred thousand dollar repair, and we were lucky enough to ask for it to be done, and they agreed to it. So they had to do a hundred thousand dollar repair on it. Does that make sense? Most termite work are not a hundred thousand dollars, but it could be a lot. 
So if you're representing seller, then you always say, okay, uh, we'll agree to termite repairs, max $2,500. We cap it. Does that make sense? So in this case, an item number two, we ask for it, but if you're representing seller, then you would counter it out, okay? Item number seven, seven, seven B2. So if you get a seller that's, that counters your 2500, then can you wait and see what the expression is? Yeah. You, then you can, then, yeah, then you can negotiate. Yeah. But if the seller doesn't, if the seller blindly accepts section one clearance, then the seller is obligated to fix it all. No, I'm saying if you're representing the buyer. Yeah, if they counter back, then just accept it. It's okay. Just accept it. But then when the when the when the report comes back, let's say they've capped it as a seller, they cap it at twenty five hundred. If the repair comes back at four thousand, then either A, the seller will say, well, no, I'm just gonna fix it, or B, the seller said, Hey, I capped it at twenty five hundred. Uh either you take the twenty five hundred or C, you just cancel. You just don't accept it. Okay? That's it. All right. But as a seller, if you blindly accept termite clearance, right, then uh, then uh, and it comes $100,000, then you stuck. You see what I'm saying? OK, so never uh, uh, when representing the seller, never blindly accept a repair without putting a cap on it, because you never know what that repair amount could be. Make sense. OK, it's important. All right. Learning this stuff will 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 make you a way better agent than most companies' agents. Yes. And then with the cold law, they actually told us never to check number two. Why? If you're representing the buyer, why does it hurt? That's what I'm asking. So. Yeah, if you if you're representing the buyer, why does it hurt? Let them counter you out. A good agent will always counter you out that. But put it in there, okay? Okay. But even in JK, sometimes they come to tax, they will not take care and repair. Please leave. Okay. All right. Can someone uh, get my uh, front desk person for me? Here, can you tell her? Merrily. Right? Yeah. Okay, I think she's walking around. It's okay. Yeah, call Linda for me. It's, it's my my thing is still going in and out. Okay, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Okay, county transfer taxes. Okay, so all right. Okay. Okay, uh, next, next. Hey, I need Sarudin in here to get this thing to work. Okay. Why do you keep leaving? <laughs> okay. All right. Items included, not included in sale. This is when, this is what we spoke about, okay? All right. Stoves, refrigerators, and washer and dryers technically aren't included with the home unless they're attached. So this is where you would check, okay, stove is included. If you're asking for the fridge, the fridge is included. Uh, if you're asking for the washer and dryer, then you would click that box. Okay, okay, all right. So these types of things, these types of things, you would check here, and then this is where you could also put in there that blinds are included, but I would put it in twice. I put it here, and I would also put it in the other terms and conditions as well, so they don't miss out on it. So there's no confusion. Spa, okay, you know, play set, playground, playground set, okay. Th that that that's what would be, uh, okay. <laughs> included in there, okay? Huh? Yeah, shed. 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 Yeah, that, that's where you put it in. Okay. 
All right. So that's where you would put that in there. Okay. All right. Excuse me. Only if you check the refrigerator if you're asking for the refrigerator to stay. So I see clients make the mistake that sometimes you go to the home, you see all these beautiful appliances, and you think that the appliances stay. They don't. One time there was a sale of a pretty luxury property, and um, and they had this coffee maker that was in a nook in the wall. And the coffee maker was like a $5,000 coffee maker. And they thought, oh, wow, I can't wait to make coffee for myself. When they came, it was taken out. Okay? Make sense? So it wasn't built out. It wasn't built. It wasn't, it wasn't attached. It was just sitting there. So it wasn't a fixture. Yeah. It wasn't a fixture. It was just sitting there. And they could say, hey, it wasn't sitting there. No screws or nothing. That's a strong assumption. That's like okay. nice Yeah. But I was able. No, 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 no. But when the agent came to me, I was able to get that thing back. So because I because 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 of the method wasn't attached, but because of its use, because because it was because it was it was there. There was a nook for something like that, you know, and, and it, it seemed it was custom for that. So I was able to get it, but but we were lucky because we didn't want to want to fight. Okay, they didn't want to fight, and we had pictures of it. So I had one where they put corn around and yelled it in. It was a uh, yeah. one of yeah. those uh, last thing. No, no. I mean, we've had instances where these people would have these flat screen TVs that were framed into the wall. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then, but, but then, but then, if, 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 but, if, but if, but really, it doesn't hurt. It only took me a second to type this in. If there's something that that you think shouldn't be included, then just put it in right there. Flat screen TV in main living room that is built into a wall. I just write it right in there. You know, the intercom system should come. But if you're, but if you're, if you're even in a little bit of doubt, put in there alarm system. Really, put in there. Type in there alarm system. Put in there intercom system. You know, it doesn't hurt. Write it in. If it came in, they wouldn't. They wouldn't say anything. That makes sense. All right. You know, so if, if when in doubt, man, put it in there. Okay, all right. Let's keep moving here. Uh, items excluded. Okay. Now, since this is a purchase, I want everyone to understand that when you go to a home, sometimes the homes have a solar system on it that is a lease, and that when you buy the home, you have to take over that lease. Okay. All right. And that lease is an extra payment. Can you put it in? So, so make sure that, make sure that, uh, this is where it talks about leaned and leased items. Okay. Make sure that you understand that if there's going to be a lease or not. Okay. You know that I, I've, um, I've seen where they've asked for a solar system and, you know, obviously it's already on this, on the roof. So, so, so buyer so seller thinks that the solar system, oh, yeah, it's already on the roof. So there you have solar system included. And seller totally forgot that, oh, their solar system is leased solar system. If you're buying it and it says the solar system is included with the purchase price, that means the seller has to pay off that solar system. Does that make sense? Seller. Seller. If, if, if you are including the solar system, with the item that's included in this oh. sales price, oh. then the solar system has to be paid off. So that's seller beware. Seller beware. <laughs> seller beware. Does it make sense? Yeah. No, but, but but then no, but that if the home has a solar system, you better be very clear with them from the very beginning. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Solar system included with the sale of this property. Okay. If it's a lease, then they'll bring it up. Say, hey, this is a lease. Okay. Then 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 your clients will have to make a decision. Do they want to take over the lease or not? Yes. So if you say included, they can't come back and say, yeah, it's included, but here's your monthly bill. No, I mean if it's included with the purchase price of the property, then it should be paid off. Okay. <laughs> but but don't leave that for guessing and arguments at later. It becomes a legal issue. Okay. Clarify. Is the solar system a lease or paid off? Okay, clarify it. Okay, all right. 
All right, anything excluded will be put here, okay? All right, okay, closing possession. Um, the default is that you, your clients, if they intend to occupy the property, put it in there, okay? If they don't, then put no, do not, okay? Okay, uh, seller occupied or vacant. So normally I would put 6 p.m. on date of closing of escrow, all right? Uh, I, I would never put no later than, okay, all right? Uh, unless you know that the seller needs to stay in possession for a week or so, okay? I would just go ahead and put on, uh, you know, 6 p.m. on date of closing for that, okay? If the seller is remaining in possession after, then you need the, the seller, uh, the seller rent back form right here, okay? These are the forms if, if the seller is going to remain in possession right well, here. You don't have to check anything. It's just no, 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 then you don't have to check anything. Okay. The rest of the contract, believe it or not, is very easy because, because, the first three pages of the contract, there's a ton of things to check, okay? After the third page, most everything rolls into default. You just need to know if you, if you don't want to go with the default, okay? So normally default for possession is 6 p.m. on date of closing, okay? All right. Um, in the contract here. Now, I'm going to give everyone a tip in real estate. I'm going to give everyone a really big tip in real estate, okay? If you want to be the very best agent you could possibly be, my biggest tip for any agent is one time, one day, sit down and read thoroughly the whole purchase agreement and all addendums involved in the purchase agreement, okay? See, we happen to be in an industry where it has to be in writing to be enforceable, okay? And because we're in an industry where a purchase agreement has to be in writing to be enforceable, your whole agreement is dictated by what's in this contract. And what you do and what you don't do will always be referred back to this contract if it ever goes to court. So because of that, your comprehension and your understanding of the contract is your armor, okay? Is your armor and your sword, okay? And your shield, where you could use the words that are in the purchase agreement to attack or defend yourself and your client. Does it make sense? Okay, so knowing the contract is very important because knowing the contract very well means that you, you actually can see loopholes you know, in what people do. So, oh, they made a mistake there. Oh, that was a mistake, okay? Oh, you know, uh, they forgot to do this. I'm not going to tell them. Me, I can always see it, you know, because I go through so many files. So I always know, oh, this agent made a mistake, okay? You just don't want to be that agent. Does it make sense? If you read your contract and you know the contract well, you won't make the mistake, okay? You won't make the mistake, okay? All right. So, all right, so um, number 10, these just says disclosures, uh, talks about different disclosures, Megan Law disclosures, gas disclosures, okay. Uh, number 11 just talks about condition of the property. Okay, so I, I, I want to go over number 11 and 12 with you a little bit. Uh, we are actually almost, uh, we're on schedule here. By 1 o'clock, we'll, we'll, we'll know, um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll be done with the contract. Number 11 and 12 is just talks about the condition of the property. All properties are sold as is. It's funny because people write up contracts or sellers will counter you back, home is sold as is, right? Of course, every contract is as is. It's already in the contract as is, okay? What the seller meant probably was they're, they're not here to fix anything, okay? But as is is already part of the contract. Technically, when you buy a home, you buy a home as is. But it's subject, it's subject to your investigations. So number 12 talks about your investigations, okay? So when you buy the home, you agree to buy the home in its present physical condition. 
but you have the right to inspect. That's why you have a home inspection done. Okay. One of the most important things that you do at the beginning of the of a transaction is that you gather information. That means the seller is going to give you disclosures, okay? And the seller is going to give you their termite report and so forth. But at the same time, your client is going to investigate. Your client can go and investigate by walking through and looking at it themselves, okay? All right? You, at the same time, and that's in a different class. I, 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 an escrow uh, period class is coming up very soon here, guys, where I'm going to teach you to go through the whole entire escrow process. All the things you do in week one, week two, all the way to closing. Does that make sense? So I'm going to be having a class like that very shortly here, okay? So look out for that class. But one of the most important things you do in the first week or two of a deal is you, your clients will inspect the property. You at the same time, are you're going to be doing what we call an AVID, which is an Asian uh, agent visual inspection disclosure, where as you're with your client and they're walking through and looking at the property, you have a form in your hand too. It's called an AVID form that you're going to have with you when you're walking through the initial walkthrough with them, and you're going to be filling out your AVID form as well for you to give to them to sign and you to provide to the other party, right? An AVID is what you see, okay, and what you know about the property. The seller agent is also going to be walking through, and they're going to provide us with their AVID. So the seller's agent is also going to be uh, providing us an AVID as well. The seller, uh, the the okay, and then the seller is going to give us a seller questionnaire and a transfer disclosure statement, okay, a TDS, okay. So these are forms that you're going to get, but this is the time where I recommend you do a home inspection, okay. Once you've done your home inspection, gathered all your information, you have the right to do what we call a, a request for repair, okay. Now during this time where you have a request for repair. I want you to understand item number 14 of this contract. This is one of the most important parts of the contract. So I highly recommend that you read it, okay, uh, uh, very carefully, okay? Okay. All right. This period of time is you have 17 days normally to inspect the property, okay, and ask for repairs or approve the condition of the property. Okay, that's called your investigation period. Okay, if everything is fine, if everything is fine, then you're supposed to remove your contingencies. You're supposed to remove your contingencies. Remember, we had a 21 day loan contingency, we had a 17 day inspection contingency. Those are called contingencies. But I'm going to tell you right now when representing buyer. Never, ever, ever remove a contingency that you're not ready to remove. Now, the word contingent means that in order for you to move forward with a contract, okay, something has to be approved by you, okay? The loan contingency or something has to be done by you. So the loan contingency basically says that you are going to move forward with this contract as long as you can get the loan. Once you know that you can get the loan and you're approved, the appraisal looks good, everything's good, then you can remove the appraisal contingency and the loan contingency. Once you've inspected the property and everything looks good, you can remove your inspection contingency. Okay? But you never, ever, ever remove any of these contingencies until you know for darn sure that, that that's no longer an issue. Make sense? So you never remove an inspection contingency if you haven't done your home inspection or, or your clients haven't waived their home inspection and, and, and you're not fully comfortable with the condition of the property. Okay? You don't remove that investigation contingency. You don't remove your loan contingency or you are absolutely sure that you're going to get the loan. You never remove your appraisal contingency unless the appraisal's done and it came in at a good value. Okay? But Robert, now the case of some lender are in buying home for GST. Mm -hmm. They don't want to do a sale. Yeah, that's fine. If they don't want it, they don't want it. It has a good value. Yeah, if they don't want it, they don't want it. So, so, okay. So don't ever remove contingencies until they're ready to be removed. Because once you remove the contingency, 
And let's say you remove the loan contingency and you couldn't get the loan, you cannot cancel based on that reason. And if your clients can't get the loan and you can't close, then you're in breach of contract and your client will lose their deposit. And so that's why I don't recommend you put a whole big old deposit because they did lose, at least not losing a lot. Okay. All right. So, so that's the contingency removal. Now, this is normally what happens in a contingency removal. Okay. You should remove your contingencies within the time specified. It says that. But if you don't remove your contingencies within the time specified, the contingencies continue. That's why in item number uh, number four, even at the end of a time specified in paragraph 14B1, and before the seller cancels, if at all, okay, pursuant in paragraph 4D, buyer retains the right in writing to either remove remaining contingencies, cancel the agree agreement, or uh, are based on remaining contingency. Once a buyer's written removal contingency is delivered, seller may not cancel this agreement pursuant to section D1. So, so how that sort of how that's interpreted is that let's say you have a 17-day inspection contingency or investigation contingency. By the 15th or 16th day, the seller's agent, if they're a good agent, will ask you to remove the contingency by the 17th day. But they will send you a notice to perform on the 15th day, giving you 48 hours to remove that contingency. Okay? If they give you the proper notice to perform and you do not remove the contingency by the time specified, they could cancel. Now, when I see that is when you are in a hot property, when you want a property and the during the time that you're in escrow, the seller gets an offer for $30,000 more than your property. They're, just waiting, they're, just waiting they're waiting to cancel waiting. on you and they're waiting for loopholes. I've seen sellers Okay, send a notice to perform to an agent, okay, to their home office on a weekend that they were gone. Okay. Yeah. So I've seen agents wait to send a notice to perform. And the rule of notices to perform is if someone – so that's probably the most feared form in this industry. It's called notice to perform. Because the notice to perform is the seller or the buyer's last warning before they have the right to cancel. So if the seller sneaks in a notice to perform and you received it in a legal method, like a fax, and you just ignored it or you didn't know about it, but you as the agent did receive it, 48 hours after receiving it, the next thing you could be receiving is a notice of cancellation. And there's nothing your buyer can do about it. You just lost them a deal. Well, as long as you know when you're going to cancel. Yeah. You so if you want to avoid that, then just remove, just, just meet the deadlines of your continuous removals yeah. and, and remove it by that time, then you're good. No loophole. But if, if they really wanted to cancel you out, they'd send you a notice before them on the 15th day. By the 17th day, you, you were just weren't paying attention. You forgot to remove your contingency. You could be, have a big fat cancellation sitting on your desk. And I think that's happening, they were returning the deposit. Yeah, but your client wanted to buy the home. Yeah, you want the home, not, not, not your deposit back. Does that make sense? Because when you're in a situation where there's 10 offers on a home, I've had situations before where, where, Seller accepts an offer, and literally half an hour after they accept the offer, an all cash offer came in at thirty thousand dollars more than that offer they just accepted. And seller agent calls me and says, "Hey, Robert, my seller just got another offer that's thirty thousand dollars more cash. Can we cancel the offer they accepted?" And my answer is no. You will have to wait during the escrow to see if there's anything that the buyer breached, then you could cancel. But for now, you can't. I got a question. Mm -hmm. So you send back an acceptance, but okay. the acceptance hasn't been. Can you send a cancellation right behind the acceptance? No, no, because it, it's an offer and acceptance. Yeah, but they and a confirmation. Huh? They have not received the acceptance. Well, they received it, but you well, if you send it in a legal method, if, 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 
but you send it in a legal form, so and then they they exactly. received it. Okay, but but I've seen like okay, example example, and this is where you have to act fast. Example, okay. So you're representing buyer. Buyer makes an offer. Okay. Uh, seller counters. You see the counter, and you tell the buyer, "Hey, great news! You know, uh, you offered four hundred thousand. They counter at four hundred two. Buyer goes, "Yeah, no, perfect. I'll take it. Uh, what time do you want? Would you like to sign it? Uh, here, I'll come by after work to sign it. Okay. During the time that you told your client that, and during the time that the client comes after work, seller gets an offer for thirty thousand dollars more. So seller sends you an email saying, "Hey, we've canceled our counter." That's what I'm saying. Can you count? Okay. No, your question was different. Okay. Oh, but it's only three days, right? I don't know. I can give you one. The counter is normally three days. Yeah. But once you counter, if they haven't accepted the counter. Okay. See, you asked, no, you, your question was if they accepted it, can you cancel after they accept it? The answer is no. If they counter well, you. I'm in on the counter. You send them back saying, well, you know, we're countering this. And you a counter is just an offer. Okay. A counter, a you counter is like their offer back to us. You have to, if, if you, okay, example, if they countered you, and then you sent a DocuSign to your client to sign it, and then you sent the DocuSign back to them, then that's accepted. That's an accepted. Yeah. They can't cancel it. But they countered you, and then you're letting time go by. You did call your client right away and told the client, hey. Uh, they countered you at three, uh, 402, your client goes, yeah, great, I'll accept it. Okay, come by my office and sign the counter. During that time, they could cancel so their counter. Until sent back on counter yeah, and even though yeah. you look at the counter and the counter says, they, we have three days to respond. Yeah, it says you have three days to respond, but in reality, you only have one second to respond. Because during that three days, if you haven't responded, they could just cancel their counter and accept another offer. I'm telling you that right now, okay? What's that? Like I make a offer on the two blanks. And they send us No, and then and then someone texts me, Silviana, on a multi and you said on a multi counter. No, that's not true. Uh, on a multi-counter, how that works is that yeah. sometimes you might make an offer, but there's multiple offers. Yeah. When you uh, when you accept a multiple offer, uh -huh. okay, let's say you made an offer, five people made an offer on one property. Yeah. That one seller countered all five people. And then you relayed that you'll accept that counter. It still is not an acceptance because if, since it's a multiple, you can't sell one property to five people. What if all five people accepted the multiple? So once, if, if it's a multiple and you accept it, then the seller has to come back and choose which of the five multiples they will accept. So or, the best. Or, or, or they'll ask for highest and best, and then you send back and they'll accept one, even though they might not even accept the highest and best. They'll just choose one they want to accept. Or if everyone comes back, they might say, I'm going to give everyone another round of highest and best. Oh, they can. And then it becomes a, an option, okay? Uh, in commercial, you see sometimes four or five rounds of highest and best. Mm -hmm. uh, or sometimes you'll just they'll stop it at one, okay? In, in residential, you see that in Bay Area a lot. You know, they'll go three or four rounds of highest and best. But just so everyone understands, when you make an offer, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. You make an offer for a property for four hundred thousand, and normally on the on on the on the back page of the offer, it says that there's an area here that gives them that gives them uh, uh, three days to respond, or you have to you can respond by a certain day. But what if you gave them three days to respond, but during the three days you found another property that just came on the market, and you like that property better, but they haven't responded to your offer yet? Can you cancel it? Yeah. Of course, they haven't accepted the offer. Even though you gave them three days to respond to your offer, if you found another property that was better that came on the market that evening, you just say, hey, we're rescinding our offer. We're withdrawing our offer, right? So the same thing, a counter offer is still the same exact word, counter offer.
Okay, so if someone ever off counter offers you and gives you three days to respond, you need to respond immediately. Don't wait three days. Don't wait one hour. If you if your clients know they want it, send them a DocuSign, have them send sign it, and boom, send it to the other client right away, and and time stamp it, so they don't have time to accept another offer. That makes sense. We work in a world of minutes. That's why when people ask me, Robert, I can't believe how easy it is to get a hold of you. People have tried it. Every one of the people in our company know it's pretty easy to get a hold of me, right? Because I understand the importance of picking up your phone and returning your call right away. Because sometimes you might be stuck in one of those situations where you need to do something now. Does it make sense? Okay. So with you, everyone in this room and every agent in the company, you, you've got to get to the point where you have to be very good on your phones. Don't let 30 minutes, hour go by because sometimes that can be the difference of you getting an offer and you know, losing the offer for your client. Does it make sense? If you're going to do something, do something on the spot. Put everything down and do it. I've seen agents in the middle of a movie, start a movie, you know, client calls or, or they get a counter in and they wait till the end of the movie to go call their client and uh, and uh, to accept the counter offer. By that time, they might have just canceled it. They might have got another offer come in, right? And just put down what you're doing. This is like a 15th, uh, this is a, a home for your client. Movie can wait. You know what I'm saying? Okay, movie can wait. Okay. The the fifteen thousand dollars you make in a commission, you can buy that movie whatever a thousand times again, you know. <laughs> okay. All right. So, anyways, let's keep going here. Okay, that's the investigation period. I spent a lot of time on that because there's a lot of important things based on the investigation periods. Okay. Okay. Um uh if we keep on going on. Uh, next one just talks about repairs, proration, broker compensation, uh, escrow. All right. There's an area for you to get initial. It's called area number 21 and 22. This is called uh, remedies for breach of contract. Okay. Dispute resolution, liquidated damages. Okay. In this area, it's important to have the clients uh, initial these areas. Because if you don't initial these areas, you're not protecting, uh, you're not protecting your client. Okay, example. In item number twenty-one, there's a liquid da da liquidated damages clause that's good for your client. Is that in the event that there is a breach of contract, the buyer shall not be responsible for more than three percent of the mutual of the purchase price of the home. Okay, you know, just in case. All right, they can't be liable for more than three percent. Of the purchase price of the home as damages all right uh in 22 it's good to initial this area because it basically says if there's a disagreement between buyer and seller that both buyer and seller will agree to go to mediation before they go to court okay they'll agree to go to mediation before they go to court okay this will save a lot of headaches because you know believe it or not you know if calm minds come together and talk and and uh you know a lot of times you get things uh, get things resolved, and then arbitration uh, is you go to binding arbitration instead of to uh, uh, to court. Okay, so so that's good for them the initial. Okay, the last part is how long you want to give them to respond to the offer. <clears throat> normally, uh, normally uh, you're giving them three days to respond, but for me, I normally click the uh, 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 buy, and I normally give them only one day to respond okay i normally give them only one or two days to respond because the quicker they can respond the the sooner i can let the client know okay so and then and the, the and the less time other people have time to put in their offer so i, I normally ask for a pretty quick response time okay four hours, four hours? yeah 24 hours or one day or two days okay all right it's just a time to respond all right and then, um, and then uh, that's basically it with that client sign. Okay, uh, the seller would sign acceptance right here and acceptance here if they accept it. If not, they would initial this box. They'll still sign it, initial a box, and then attach a counter offer if they're countering. This area is easy, self-explanatory. This is just where you put your uh, the company address, your information, your cell phone number. So your telephone number and whatever, okay? This is where you put the escrow information, all right? So the, who you use for escrow, okay? 
All right, um, let's move on to the next forum, see how we're doing on time. See, almost perfect timing here. Uh, the next forum is the buyer inspection advisory. This basically says, okay, uh, uh, this basically says that there's a buyer inspection advisory. It just says that these are things to, to look for uh, when you're uh, inspecting the property or, or, or when you're going through the property, the buyer needs to sort of uh, look at this. You know, it says to buyer that, hey, you know, uh, you know, good things to know about the property. It's if it's working properly, the square footage, if it's accurate or not. Uh, you know, we've asked for a termite inspection or not. If it's good to know if there's termites, you know, so these are just things, you know, it's good to know the school district neighborhood. Don't buy the home from us and, and think we are in the world's best neighborhood. Find out for yourself. Okay. We can't be liable for that. that that's just a, 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 a advisory to the client. Okay. And that's basically it. You would fill all of these forms out, get them all signed. Okay. I normally, and my last comment is, is I normally advise that when you submit an offer, you submit an offer with the prequal letter or, you know, a very strong prequal letter. I also would submit an offer with a, with a nice email, giving a little summary of why my client is a good client. Okay. Uh, I, I, I normally would uh, call the agent to make sure that the agent looked for the offer. Say, hey, Mr. Or Mrs. Agent, I'm sending you an offer on your listing at 1234 Main Street, okay? My client is a very serious buyer. They're putting 20% down. Uh, the, I'm sending you the pre-approval letter. The pre-approval letter already has verified their funds to close, okay? Uh, this is a very clean offer. We're not asking for a lot of closing costs that are out of the ordinary. You know, please uh, accept my offer. By the way, in the offer, we are asking for the spa and the playground to stay with the home. Okay. And then give them a summary and then send it on over. Okay. So, and then, and, and of course, put a copy of the deposit in there with them. All right. And uh, that's it. If you were writing an offer for the first, second, or third time, then before you'd send the offer over to them, uh, you would call me and send me a copy of the offer. Okay. If it's your first, second, or third time, uh, send me a copy of your offer. It doesn't take me very long to look at it and uh, make sure you didn't miss anything small. Okay. And then that's it. Okay. That's it. Uh, and then I'd say, okay, you're good to go. Go ahead and send it out. All right. And, um, and that's it. Now, a little bit of advice on, on working on your first deal is when you're doing your very first deal or second deal or third deal, I always recommend one of two things. I always recommend a, um, you work with a mentor, okay, or B, you know, if you're very good, if you're very good at reading, to make sure you understand and read everything, and you work with a very good transaction coordinator, okay? All right, we have uh, three uh, transaction coordinators at our office to choose from, okay, three uh, coordinators at our office to choose from, and uh, we have a, we could give you a list of them. Uh, at the office, okay? Worth every penny. Huh? Worth every penny. Yeah. So please use the transaction coordinators. All right. They're very good. Uh, and, and they work directly with my auditing department to make sure your file's audited properly so you get your checks on time. But at the same time, you know, uh, uh, if, uh, if, you're, if you want more hands on, then I'll, uh, I, could, I could have you work with a mentor, no problem, okay? Mentor is not being on someone's team. It's just, you know, someone I guess assign you to work with and mentor you on your first few transactions, okay? And that that's always, you know, that's always really good. You know, I had a mentor when I first started real estate too, okay? Other than that, uh, congratulations. You've uh, gone through the entire purchase agreement. And uh, if you have any questions, you can feel free and call me. My phone number is 916-803-6611 uh, or email me at robert.doe at elitenorcal.com, okay? All right, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Good day. Thank you, Robert. All right. Thank you. 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 Thank you.